So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the UCLA School of Nursing Fall 2020-23, or we could say 24, 25, depending on when you guys are ready to apply. Uh, today's information session will be uh, for those that are interested in our PhD program. Um, again, my name is Mark Coben. I am the Director of Recruitment, Outreach, and Admission. And again, you'll see my colleague, Dr. Wendy Robbins, who will be taking over in just a little bit. Um, but what we want to do is just um, let you know and give you a little bit of purpose and share what, you know, we want this information session to do for you all. So, of course, what we want to do is share specific information as it pertains to this pro licensure program. As you guys know, we use acronyms here on campus and pretty much everyone knows what PhD stands for. But of course, it is the Doctor of Philosophy. Okay, so for today's agenda, um, I will finish up my welcome and then I will pass it on to Dr. Robbins. And then after that, I will come back and I will go through the admissions and application process. And then our director of financial aid, uh, Leonie Thomas, um, is not actually going to be joining us, joining us in the physical, but she recorded a nice uh, section in terms of the financial aid tuition and fees. And then what we'll do is we'll take a quick little pause because I know after that, it's like we've been going for almost an hour. So maybe a quick stretch break. And then we will continue on uh, with the faculty research, research and clinical experience panel. And then we'll go ahead and finish it up with the doctoral uh, student panel as well. So I think these last two will be really uh, good for you guys and informative and we'll have some really good dialogue. Okay, so a lot of people always ask why UCLA? Um, and I always use this same example, but I think what it does is it really gives a good depiction of what it's like. Um, so if you guys have not been on the UCLA campus before, it's pretty big, right? And so what I always like to say is that UCLA is its own community within the Los Angeles limits. Um, what does that mean? Obviously, you guys should know that we have the uh, Ronald Reagan Medical Center on campus. But along with that, oh, and also let me say, number one hospital on the West Coast. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but then along with that, we have our own uh, police department. Of course, so you know safety is number one, but also with that we have transportation. Uh, we have what I always say, probably the world's biggest grocery store, uh, Ralph's. It's it, it's probably the biggest one I've been in, but which pretty much has everything you need. Um, and then as you get pretty much into the village, we have all the retail shops, places to eat, and entertainment. And so, in essence, the university pretty much is its own small community. I think the same thing happens within the School of Nursing if you're looking at it within the scope of UCLA. Not that we have retail stores or entertainment, um, but what we do provide for our students are tons of resources. Um, and so one would be your student service coordinator, who is someone who is also going to be helping you as you matriculate throughout the program. You're going to have faculty advisor. Um, you will have also have a program uh, director. We have a mentorship program, which I think is really cool. What we do is we set up first year incoming PhD students and we match them up with the second year. And I think it's a good way to um, to have it to where students are befriending each other, um, becoming friends, um, and then knowing that your mentor is going to be able to pass down some really cool information to you. Um, if it's, you know, books, how to study, you know, uh, look out for this class, whatever the case is. So we, we do feel that this is a really good thing for our students. One thing I also mentioned before, um, which is our director of financial aid, Leonie Thomas, um, this is something that is different compared to other departments. Um, typically, a grad student will have to go to upper campus um, and you know speak to a financial aid advisor. And the cool thing here is we have all that here within the School of Nursing. So I can kind of, kind of go on and on in terms of what we have to offer, but we do feel that's one of, one of the reasons why we're reported as one of the best grad schools. Um, and so that is something I do believe we're really excited about. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Wendy Robbins, and she's going to give you a little bit of introduction about the school and the PhD program. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us to learn about our dynamic PhD program here at the UCLA School of Nursing. And next slide, um, to give you some perspective our vision at the School of Nursing is to lead and transform nursing science, how nursing is taught, and how nursing is practiced. And our mission is to improve the health, wellness, quality of life, and nursing care of the people of California, the nation, and the world through our education, research, nursing care, 
and community engagement. And that's a picture of the School of Nursing right there. If you haven't seen it before, uh, going up to the front door. So we have five programs in the school. We have a bachelor's. Uh, we have a master's entry program. We have APRN and P program. We have a doctorate of nursing practice, and we have the PhD. The PhD is the highest academic degree anyone can earn. We have about 44 PhD students now, and that's within the total population of the School of Nursing of about 600 students. Um, so a little bit about our program. It's a four-year program. You earn your PhD in four years. Um, and and it, our program is aligned with the 2022 AACN Pathways to Excellence Statement for the Research Focused Doctorate. Well, what does that mean? Well, AACN is the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. And that's the national body that sets the standards for nursing education. So our PhD program aligns with those standards. And um, so we, we prepare our graduates to develop the science of nursing and steward the discipline of nursing. Okay, code words again, what does that mean? <laughs> well, nursing is a discipline, right? Um, it's a discipline that generates knowledge by empirical research and uh, methods of uh, inquiry. So that's what we're preparing our PhD students for, develop the science of nursing, and then also steward the discipline of nursing. And what that has to do with is that's preparing the next generation. There aren't enough PhD nurses um, to, to fill all the need in, in the, the world, in the nation, in our state, in our school. I mean, you know, there just aren't enough PhD prepared nurses. And so we want to um, look at the next generation and we want to make sure that we instill in them all of the um, history and all of the um, goals that we have for our discipline. So if you come here, you will be taught and mentored by leaders in the field of nursing. When I say leaders in the field, I really mean leaders in the field across the nation. And not only that, we are a top 10 research university. So across the campus, um, we're always in the top 10 of funding. It's billions of dollars a year. And for our PhD students, what that means is that you may align with other researchers on campus who have resources that you could use for your research and you can avail yourself of this. Everybody on campus um, is, is really fond of PhD students and so they're willing to share. So uh, teaching and mentorship by leaders in nursing in all areas of research. Um, oh, and then we have our practice partners across the street at Ronald Reagan um, that we work with as well. So uh, lots of opportunities. The program is a highly individualized program of study. And um, what that means is we um, help you develop expertise in the core discipline of nursing, but also you select your area that you're interested in. And we make sure from all the resources that we have available to us, on this campus that you develop the expertise in that select area of research. Uh, next slide. A bit about our nursing faculty and their research. Uh, there are, there are um, varied programs of research within the school. Uh, these are some areas where there are more than one researcher who's working in that particular uh, concentration. So brain-body connections, um, a lot of um, imaging studies, uh, imaging used for, um, you know, helping uh, people with diabetes uh, maintain adherence, 
um, a lot of imaging studies done by the nursing faculty here. And uh, cardiovascular health, we have a strong research group in cardiovascular. And um, one of the leaders there will come and talk to you at the end of the information session. Data science. We have um, three or four really strong faculty in data science. And so I don't know if you've heard about the mobile medical devices and um, AI and all of that, um, large data sets. And so we have people here who do that research, if that's your interest environment, work, and health. Um, we have uh, research, I'm, I'm in this group actually, and I'll come back and tell you about our training grant later. But um, you know, it's all about climate change, right? And so um, environment affects health, we know that. And work affects health, we know that. So that's where, where we study. HIV AIDS, uh, we have both um, um, laboratory-based research in HIV and, and also um, community research, uh, a lot of very strong projects, and other infectious diseases um, like um, human papillomavirus. And of course, COVID, uh, we study, have people who study all of those. Healthy aging is really big. We've had um, several uh, well-funded faculty in health the aging, um, mental health, um, uh, an area that uh, is close to or exactly what you want to study. Next slide. So some, some things about our curriculum. I told you that it was four years, and it is based on a four-year curriculum. Um, and if you can dream it, you can do it at UCLA. You can have your PhD in four years. So the first two years um, actually are uh, these two, um, year one and two, kind of overlap a bit. Um, but this is where we get the core, the core philosophy of science, theory, ethics, how that impacts how you write a research question, um, nursing science, what's been published, what do we know, uh, what don't we know, policy, big big piece on policy and health equity, always health equity um, throughout our, our coursework. We have uh, the faculty, one of our faculty in qualitative research methods uh, won a, the uh, UCLA teaching award not too long ago. It's highly competitive. She's very well known and, and um, so yeah. And then statistical methods, grantsmanship, all of that is the first two years. That's core. And then from then on, it's you and your dissertation. And that's uh, the focus. Um, you form your dissertation committee. Uh, you write your plan for your research. And then you get with your committee and you defend that plan for your research. They help you refine it. Uh, and get it going. Um, and then you actually get out into the field and start collecting your data. Year four, you generally complete your, your research and start analyzing your data and write up your dissertation. Defend your dissertation, and then you graduate. You know, there you go, four years. Um, and throughout, you will have an advisor, you will have a chair of your dissertation committee. You will be mentored, as Mark said, by other PhD students. You will be mentored by other faculty. You will have um, multiple opportunities for hands-on research experiences. And they don't need to be always in the School of Nursing with nursing faculty. They can be in the Fielding School of Public Health. They can be in the Geffen School of Medicine. They can be in the so School of Social Welfare. Um, lots of uh, hands-on research experiences. And then also the specialty, your specialty area. We help you find what you need to gain the depth that you will need to have in your specialty area. Have any questions on that? I think that's my last slide for this part. No question? Okay, 
Mark, where are you? I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. So, um, okay, so I'll go ahead and take over for the application process. And then Dr. Robbins, you'll join us back again later on in the session. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so no questions thus far? We're good? Okay, awesome. All right, so of the few of you that are here, have you guys started the application process at all? No, you don't have to. You don't, don't, don't feel like you have to say yes. Okay, so what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to stop my video just because it seems like my internet connection is not great right now. So I apologize, I'm just gonna stop my, my video, but I'm still here. Um, okay, so for the application process, um, for those that are gonna be interested in applying for this fall 2023, uh, you're going to go to the UCLA Graduate Division application. Okay, so in order to access the application, you'll be going to grad.ucla.edu. So the application is available now. Um, it opened up, I believe, last month, actually to the day. I think it actually opened up September 12th or the 14th, um, but it was about a month ago. Um, and what you'll probably see on one of the next few slides is the deadline, um, which is going to be December 1st. Okay, so these deadlines are typically the same for every year, depending on the admission cycle that you're ready to enter. So again, for this year, December 1st to enter fall 2023. If you're interested in the next year, it's going to be December 1st of 2023 for fall 2024. So that's pretty much just kind of how it goes there. Um, so as you get into the application, it's going to ask you for basically um, some general kind of like biographical data information. Um, address and so forth in terms of, you know, where you live and who you are. But along with that, it's also going to ask you for your plans of graduate study. Okay. And so with that, we're going to want you to select your application type. And so for the application type, there's three, there's going to be new, there's going to be readmission and renewal. Okay. So new is for anyone who's going to be applying for the first time at UCLA for graduate study. Um, Renewal is going to be for someone who's actually applied, um, was admitted, but did not start the program. And readmission is going to be for someone um, who has uh, applied and has completed a, a graduate degree here at UCLA. So those are the three types. So I'm assuming that most of the people here will be applying as the application type for new. Next, it's going to ask you for the major and program. And so in the School of Nursing, as Dr. Robbins mentioned, we have about four different um, programs that we offer, and we have um, a little bit more in terms of the graduate application. And so you want to make sure that you're going to be selecting nursing PhD. Okay, so there's going to give you the option of nursing APRN, nursing MECN, nursing PhD, and nursing uh, DNP. So you want to make sure that you're going to be selecting nursing PhD. So I believe I left off in terms of the plans for graduate study, right? And so um, it's going to ask for three different types. Uh, and so new is going to be for individuals like yourself uh, who may be applying for the first time. Um, and then next, it's going to ask for readmission. So that's going to be for someone who has completed a graduate degree here at UCLA, and they want to receive another one. And renewal is for someone who has uh, I'm sorry, who has applied, been admitted, um, but they did not complete or even start the program, okay? So there's going to be three application types. Um, as you select the major in the program, there's going to be, uh, this is actually where it's really specific in terms of you want to make sure that you're selecting the right type uh, because we offer a nursing MSN, uh, APRN, uh, MECN, which is our master's entry, PhD, of course, and DMP. And so by selecting the right major, slash program, it's then gonna direct you to the correct application, okay? So this is just as important as making sure that you're selecting the right application type, is making sure that you're gonna select nursing PhD. Okay, so um, as you're going through the application, it's gonna ask for you to submit your unofficial transcripts at the same time also uploading um, uh, your transcripts and indicating your highest education. Okay, so what it's gonna do, it's gonna ask, 
uh, you received uh, a bachelor's degree or multiple bachelor's degrees, you're going to enter those institutions. It's going to ask for you to enter your master's degree and or if you have any other graduate degrees. And then along with that, as you're entering that information, it's going to ask for you to upload an unofficial transcript. The thing that's changed from this year from years past is that um, in, the, in the previous years, it would require students or applicants, I should say, to submit official transcripts. The cool thing is you get to save your money and, and at the time being and submit your unofficial transcripts. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to just retrieve them from um, your alma mater and they should be able to send those to you via uh, an email and a PDF form and you'll be able to upload them that way. Now, if admitted into the program, uh, we will then go ahead and ask for you to submit official transcripts. So we do ask for them at a later time, but at least you'll be able to wait on that and send it later. Um, there are two ways to send those and you'll probably see them in the next slide is uh, we now accept electronic official transcripts and or they could be sealed um, in a physical copy. Okay, so next there's gonna be a statement of purpose, um, which is gonna be one of the first two essays, okay? And so in the statement of purpose, uh, the UCLA graduate division has increased it to a thousand words, which is a lot better than the 500 they were only allowing in the years past. Uh, I'm not sure how they're gonna want you to write all this sort of stuff within 500 words. So at least they increased it to a thousand. Um, but there are some questions that they're gonna be asking from you. You do not have to answer all of them, uh, but if you want to incorporate your answers within these, you can do that. And so uh, basically the first one is gonna be your reasons for applying, uh, for wanting to apply to graduate study. Okay, so more specifically, really why do you wanna apply for a graduate study here at UCLA? Um, next, they're gonna ask for you to describe your reasons for wanting to enter a PhD program and specifically the School of Nursing. So I know you guys all have pretty much your particular reasons of why you wanna further your education and get a doctorate degree. And so this is really gonna be the, the part where you're gonna be able to explain it here. Um, you'll also be able to explain in terms of what your research interest is as well. So you're going to want to enter that here. With that, uh, they're also going to ask for you to include any information in terms of type of background that you've been, uh, that you have in terms of like training or any other type of experience that you think is relevant to applying to your doctoral studies. Uh, and then also, again, maybe to that research interest as well. Okay. Uh, with that, as we follow on with the next three questions, they want you to provide a ballast assessment, right? In terms of what your, your personal characteristics are. So you're gonna wanna enter or talk about your strengths, your weaknesses, and any areas that you think you would even need to, uh, to have some, something that's in, improved. Uh, we want you to talk about your characteristics um, as well. And that could talk about anything in terms of individual or group interactions. As you guys all know, as being nurses, uh, it's more of a, of a group. Um, affair than it is something that's individual. Um, you just want to talk about those. If you're part of any um, organizations, talk about that. Talk about your leadership style, um, any other qualities that you possess as well. The next question is going to ask for you to briefly describe a, pro uh, a problem in nursing science. Um, and that's obviously going to be your research. So this is really going to be really the meat of it and really talking about that within the focus. Okay, so that's going to be the part that's really going to be important. One thing um, that may be reiterated throughout today's session is going to be if you haven't already, um, I would recommend going to our website um, and or I can send that to you uh, myself and take a look at the different uh, faculty members that we have and the research interests um, in terms of what they do. I know Dr. Robbins talked about a, um, a little bit in terms of all the different areas that our faculty members have or are interested in. Um, but we recommend that you also do that as well. And I think that's another cool thing in terms of what you'll see later on is our faculty panel is that uh, there's going to be about four of them, but they are going to be diverse in terms of what they do. Um, and so I think this is what really is going to help us, again, as you're describing the problem, um, hopefully having a research that matches up, um, you can talk about that as well. And then uh, we also want you to talk about um, how you think you'll be able to contribute uh, once you are able to earn your degree into the nursing profession, All right? So I know it might be similar as you guys were um, receiving a BSN or maybe a master's entry and or another master's program, right? It's knowing that, hey, I want to enter or further my education in this profession because of X, Y, and Z. And so the same is going to be in terms of your doctorate degree. Okay, so for the last two questions, 
um, they're going to ask, how do you expect your doctoral studies at UCLA to facilitate your career? So it's almost kind of the same thing in the overlapping question. Um, so you want to talk about, again, what your career goals are in that sense. Um, and then, oh, that's what this last part is here. So is that we strongly consider that you, uh, you reach out uh, to our faculty. Um, uh, you can email them uh, to set up a Zoom session, maybe an in-person face-to-face. But I think what this really does is it really gives you a jump start um, into applying and or being admitted to the program. It's going to be really good to have a faculty member who can back you up um, and say, hey, yes, I would love to take this individual on as an advisor. So it's a really good way for you to say, hey, I have this research um, and I know that there's someone out there that has something that is exactly like mine or something that's similar like mine and that will help me progress as I go throughout the program. Okay, so for the personal statement, which is gonna be the second part of the essays, um, is where they want you to be a little bit more personal. So it's a little bit weird, right? I was like, you know, it's a personal statement, so it may seem obvious. Um, but what they want you to not do is kind of duplicate your answers, but in this sense, really get more down to who you are as an individual. Um, and so again, you're gonna describe your background, your accomplishments and life experiences, what you've done a little bit in the statement of purpose, so you don't have to elaborate too much on that, but really talk about the life experiences that have led you to the decision to applying for this graduate degree. Okay, so talking about if it happened from childhood as an adult, if it's different situations and life experience that you've gone through, really talk about that. Uh, we also want you to include anything that's educational, uh, that may be cultural, economic, or any type of social experience. Um, I know one kind of easy example would be as if you're first generation, um, you know, the different challenges, obviously, as it is progressing from an undergraduate all the way to receiving your doctoral degree. Uh, so anything that's relevant to your academic journey would be one. Um, also with that, uh, describe um, any aspects of your personal background, accomplishments, and achievements um, that you think would help elevate uh, you in terms of your contributions to applying to this doctoral degree. And then last, we want you to talk about any type of multicultural and or diversity experience. Um, that is one thing that we're really big on is how we can serve our different communities um, in terms of public service um, within the education and academia. And so definitely wanna talk about that, right? If you have any of those, talk about what you've been doing and how that's been important to you. And so for the personal statement, it is a little bit less, obviously it's gonna be 500 words. Um, and I believe if it comes out to being single space, it's about a page. Um, and so, yeah, the personal statement probably be two pages, two, maybe two and a half, whereas the uh, personal statement is going to be one. Um, one other thing as well, which Neely may um, allude to in her section, is that uh, the personal statement is going to be part of what's going to be used for the fellowships um, and or slash scholarships that you'll be eligible to receive. Okay, so both essays obviously are important in terms of the admissions process, um, but there's going to be one that's going to be viewed uh, in terms of furthering you as you're, you're admitted into receiving more funding. Okay, so resume, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what we want you to do, and also when we say resume slash CV, so it depends on how someone wants to put it together, but we accept both. Uh, but what we want you to do to, is to highlight your educational experiences, right, from highest uh, honors received, um, and then also put any work experience, voluntary experience, your professional organizations and associations that you belong to. Chronological order, of course. Um, and one thing also is that typically people think, you know, like a work resume, you have it be within one page, feel free to make it two, even three. You know, for this, um, we want you to, to not shy away from putting what you think is important down. Okay, so feel free to increase it to as many pages as you like, but typically um, an applicant will probably send maybe a, maybe a two-pager, but three would be fine as well. Yep. Oh, okay, and so here are just some of the things that people typically list, right? So you don't want to leave out any publications, of course, um, if you've been invited to, you know, uh, do any lectures, uh, community service, public service, uh, any certifications. I'm pretty much sure that you guys have all that in resume format, but again, we just want to reiterate that we hope that you guys will list all of those down. Um, some people do it in the sense of like even bullet points, you know, elaborating a little bit more in terms of what they've done. Um, a lot of times uh, people work or volunteer for organizations, they put them in acronyms and then 
you know, we probably will assume that the person reading it will know what it is. Um, and so feel free just to, to dive into that a little bit more as well. Okay, so next is gonna be letters of recommendations. And so we do ask that applicants submit three letters of recommendations. Um, and so you'll see these kind of two quick bullets, um, which are fairly easy, but I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more into that though. Uh, but first we want you to choose professionals, right? So just know family or friends, uh, but someone that may have served as a supervisory role uh, or maybe even an educational mentoring relationship with you, okay? And so of that, you know, people use um, employers, supervisors, um, mentors, uh, other faculty members, whoever you think would be able to write you the best letter recommendation. But it's a little bit different in terms of, it's not just saying, hey, um, I'm gonna be applying to UCLA's you know, PhD, uh, PhD program in the School of Nursing, can you just write me a letter? What ends up happening is, and once you get into the application, you're gonna enter your recommender's information in terms of their name um, and their email address. Once you press the add button, they will be sent an email uh, which will come from UCLA Graduate Division that says, hey, they've been um, selected to write a letter recommendation on the behalf of you, the applicant. There's gonna be a link. They'll click on that link. And then what it will do is it will then send them to the PhD recommendation form. One thing I also want to mention is as you're also putting the recommender's information down, um, it's gonna say select the recommendation type. Um, I believe there's one that says general, and then there's going to be a Bobby, the other four nursing recommendation forms, which again is going to be MECAN, APRN, PhD, and DMP. It's really adamant that you select the PhD. Okay, so once you select P nursing PhD form, that's going to be the correct one that's going to be sent to your recommenders to submit or to complete and submit. Um, there are times where individuals may forget and uh, they're gonna say, hey, yeah, just you know, send them the general uh, recommendation letter. The unfortunate thing is once your recommender gets that and they complete it, uh, myself and all of my team may see that it's the different one. And then we're gonna have to go back to you and say, hey, unfortunately uh, you had your recommender submit the wrong one. Could you please have them do it again? So we know kind of time of the essence for our recommenders. And so we just wanna make sure that we're having them complete the right one. So again, of the recommendation form, uh, there's gonna be just some questions that they'll be able to write and answers in terms of who you are as an individual, who you are as, as a potential uh, PhD student and candidate. And then there is an option for them to upload a letter as well. Okay, so it's kind of two forms in a sense, that, that, that required form for the School of Nursing. And then if they want to upload a letter, they can do that um, as well. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Uh, actually, this should say nursing, um, this should actually say, sorry, this should actually be gone because this is not for our innocent APRN, this is for our PhD, so skip this part here, but the prerequisites are correct. Uh, and so we're gonna require two from you. Um, one is gonna be a biostatistics course and then nursing research. And so with that, for biostatistics, if you guys are unfamiliar with UCLA, that's, that's totally fine. But basically what we're saying is that the content has to be equivalent to biostatistics 100A and or biomathematics uh, 170A. Typically it has to be within four quarter units or five, depending on if you guys were within the semester. Um, but the thing that's most important is it has to be completed within the last three years. Um, and then also for nursing research, it has to be at the graduate level um, if you guys have completed your MSN. If you guys are thinking about, or not thinking about, but if you guys are BSN prepared, um, as you know, we do have the BS and the PhD, which would be fine. We'd be able to accept your undergraduate level uh, nursing research course. If you guys had any questions in terms of seeing uh, if the courses that you completed are equivalent, we do have a list of approved courses. Uh, for our PhD prerequisites on our website. So it is really cool. You'll be able to click on those. Um, and we have pretty much a full list of universities throughout the country. We don't have everyone. And that doesn't mean if you have attended university and completed one of these prerequisites and it's not on our list, it does not mean that it's not accepted. It just means that maybe we just have not run across it. And so what I love to tell individuals is to feel free to send me an email with that course description, course syllabus, and then we'll be able to evaluate it and let you know if it's equivalent and something that we will um, 
accept. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanna to wanna to mention. If we go back, back up to the bullet before that, we do require that all prerequisites have a completion of C or better, okay? If you look at that third bullet, it's kind of like hidden in between all of these bullets, but the GRE is required um, as of now. Now, the reason why we just kind of splashed that in there in terms of GRE required is we don't have like a minimum score that we're looking for um, in terms of like the analytic, analytical part, um, the math part and so forth. Um, but what it does is it's actually a requirement for a graduate um, uh, division in terms of people that are going to be going for a doctorate degree, GRE is also required. But with that, what it does is just it lends the, the application reviewers another understanding typically uh, of just who you are. I will say just from sending my seat in the years past, um, the biggest part of the GRE that does um, kind of get a revision uh, or I should say something that's looked at is going to be the analytical part, which is the writing. Um, so obviously, as you know, there's going to be tons of writing that you'll be having to do within this doctoral program. And so I believe they look at the writing portion more than anything. Um, don't be scared knowing that, oh, my gosh, you know, the deadline is December 1st. I have to do all this studying for it. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say, yeah, spend all your time studying. Uh, maybe some refreshers, grab a book, skim through it. Uh, but just feel comfortable as you're going to take that exam. Uh, but, but don't feel you know, the pressure with that. Also, let me back up. Um, with December 1st being the deadline, that's to submit your application, which you'll see in some of the next, probably in the next couple of slides, is that we have a January 15th deadline, which is kind of like an extended deadline for those that submitted the December 1st deadline to have anything else submitted. Meaning, so you have your recommender's information, you've, you've added them to your application, and for some reason, they've been sitting on it and they haven't submitted it by December 1st. That's fine. We give them that last deadline of January 15th to do so. The same thing would be for, again, the GRE. So I think that's a really good example of saying, hey, I want to just submit my application by December 1st. Worry about the GRE in the next month, month and a half to submit those scores. OK, so just to throw that out there. We're also going to ask that you uh, have your uh, state license. Um, and that you have that by the time that you enter the program. So again, if that's here in California, another state, or even in a, your home country, uh, that will be needed by the time you start the program in the fall. If there's any international students out there, we will require for you to take the TOEFL exam um, if uh, you graduated from a foreign university where the primary language was not English. Uh, one thing that we always have to say, which is, probably pretty weird in a sense, um, but again, it's a graduate division requirement that if you graduated from the Philippines, um, that you would still have to take the TOEFL exam. Um, don't know why, but unfortunately that is a requirement. Um, but for individuals that do have to take it, you can do that or you can take the IELTS. Um, so for TOEFL, it's, 80, it's at least an 87, the IELTS is a seven or higher. And so you'll see uh, the, the codes here for those that need to take it. Institution code is gonna be 48, Three seven, and then the intended graduate uh, graduate major code is going to be zero six uh, one zero, and then the CGFNS is also going to be required uh, for international applicants who are not licensed or registered uh, as a nurse here in the U.S. Uh, so there could be two exams that you're going to have to take as well. Okay. So there's going to be a second kind of phase or a second round in terms of the application, and that's going to be the interview. Okay, and so as you're submitting your application December 1st, it will get reviewed um, by a minimum of two uh, faculty reviewers. Um, and so those that are able to move on to the second round are gonna be those that are uh, scored highly within the first phase of the application. Uh, what I will end up doing um, and saying, hey, congratulations, you've moved on to the second round. We would love to interview you uh, via Zoom. And then what I will do is uh, send you uh, some dates um, so we can match you up with these, your calendar invite with the um, days available for our faculty. Uh, Zoom interviews are typically about 30 minutes in length, so they're not super long, uh, but it's really just another way for you uh, to discuss um, and kind of, you know, dive deep into what your focus is in terms of uh, your research interests. Um, and again, how you pretty much see yourself in terms of planning your doctoral studies here in the UCLA School of Nursing. Um, so it's just another phase. It's another way of um, 
also have in our faculty say, yes, we may have someone that has that same similar uh, research interest, and then also making sure that, hey, th that we will be able to provide you the best you know, opportunity to be able to succeed. Um, and so that's pretty much what the second interview phase is. Um, let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so before we continue with this, um, I also want to say uh, the goal is with December 1st being the application deadline, our goal is to notify applicants as early as February um, in the admission decision. Okay, so if we could do it in the month of January, we can, we're pushing it there, but definitely in the month of February is when we want to notify you of your acceptance. Um, with that, we know we're going to be competing with other schools, and so we also want to put that deadline or that pressure on us to make sure that uh, we can also help you with the funding aspect as well. And so that's where Leone uh, jumps in with us to make sure that we're going to be able to do what we can to grab you as a student. Is there any questions on that? I know it went by that kind of fast. Um, but again, if we're thinking about uh, the, the phases of the application, right? So you're going to be submitting a statement of purpose a personal statement, you're going to be uploading your resume, um, you're going to be selecting your three recommenders to write you three letters of recommendations, um, and then you're going to be submitting your GRE scores. Um, and then next phase is going to be the interviews. Ah, I caught myself. There's also one other thing that the application will tell you. It's going to ask for you to upload a writing sample. Okay, so your writing sample can be from your, your undergraduate or graduate, if it's a thesis or, you know, your best writing, um, if you've done some research, whatever the case is, you will be able to upload that um, as well. Quick turnaround, if, again, if you think about it, applying from December 1st here in February, about two months, it may be a little agonizing for you, uh, you know, a little bit of nerves, but for us, it's pretty fast of trying to get that ball rolling. Uh, from my side in the admissions office, and then also to um, our faculty as well. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, last but not least, kind of been saying those, um, but again, there is the actual uh, deadlines again uh, for our program. So again, December 1st, which looks like it's gonna fall on a Thursday this year. Um, and so also one thing, it's going to be 11.59 p.m. on December 1st. The application uh, system, which is Slate, is on Eastern Standard Time. So uh, if you submit it like at 11 p.m. on December 1st, it's going to say, congratulations, yay, you submitted your application December 2nd at uh, 2 a.m., right, if I got that correct. Uh, so don't be alarmed. Um, we know it's Eastern Standard Time. Obviously, we'll accept it. Um, so don't, don't be worried with that. Uh, same thing also with the accompanying documentations, as I kind of stated before, if it's letters of rec or maybe GRE, it's going to be January 15th, which looks like it's fallen on a Sunday this year. Um, and so, yeah. One other thing I want to say is that uh, when you submit your application, it's not like you're, like you're, it's just going to be a ghost. And then for two months, you're not going to hear from us. So my team, uh, we do a really good job of staying in, um, in, in dialogue or, or conversation with you to say, hey, thanks for applying. Uh, we have these documents um, and or these things are, you know, are still missing. Um, so you'll get several emails from us uh, just to let you know that, hey, you know, we're still thinking about you. Take your time if there's things that you still need to get done. Um, but we would love to have those be sent before the January 15th uh, deadline. Okay. Um, okay. Ah, so when I keep saying about my team, here we are. Uh, so again, I'm Mark Coven. Um, you'll see Jamie Gamo, who is next to me on the right, and then Natalie Asensio, uh, who's going to be right below us. So it's going to be a team of three um, who are going to be um, working with our, um, our faculty to make sure that we're going through the application process and get you guys admitted. Uh, one last thing I believe is going to be, again, as I was stating a little bit earlier, in terms of the transcripts, you do not, again, have to submit official transcripts as of now, right? The application is going to let you upload unofficial transcripts. 
Um, if you want to take a screenshot, say, hey, I'm gonna worry about this later because what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, congratulations, you've been admitted, but you know, now send us your official transcripts. And so you can do that two ways, which is really cool. Um, now a lot of universities are submitting electronic official transcripts and those uh, come rapidly, really fast. That We pretty much get them within the same day, if not the next day, which makes it a lot easier for us. But if your school says, hey, you know, sorry, we're not on that yet, <laughs> we can send those in the mail. That's totally fine too, um, but uh, it may take a little bit longer. It may take up to a week, week and a half, um, or even two. And so here's just the address for that, but we will make sure to indicate um, both these options for you um, in the springtime or before spring. Okay, aha. So yes, this is on me in terms of seeing if you guys have any questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if you guys have any questions, feel free to unmute, put in the chat, whatever you like. And I'm gonna get Leone's section up and running for us. Okay. I have a quick question. Okay. Let's see. I, I missed the beginning just from a different meeting. Oh, is this wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I hear you talking, but for some reason oh, okay. the audio is not up. Sorry. Oh, okay. Hi, okay. I'm Julie. Hi, I Julie. missed you. Hi. Um, sorry, I came in late. I got stuck in another meeting for a little bit. No, it's okay. Um, is your recording going to be available? It is. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be available. I kind of messed up, so I, I was on my laptop. And of course, the internet was just unstable, even though I'm on university grounds. So of course, that happens when you want to record a session. Um, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of editing, making sure that it you know, kind of is cohesive. But yes, I will make sure that this is uh, recorded and I can have this sent to you guys. Um, but it's also going to be uploaded um, into uh, our information session webpage, uh, which is going to be that same link that people were using to RSVP. And you mentioned the GRE. Yes. So it is required for the PhD application? It is. Okay. It is. And so um, I, I, it's always a little bit weird for me because it's like, hey, it's a requirement. But like other universities might say, yes, we're looking for, you know, for you to be like in the 50 percentile or whatever the case is. And it's, not, it's really not for us. It's, it's a university, you know, requirement. Um, which means in order to get into our program, you have to submit your scores. Now, with that, you know, typically I, I don't say, hey, you know, don't study and just, you know, go into the day of and take it. Some people can do that and still score well, um, and that's totally fine. Uh, but I was saying earlier, though, is that of the, the three different sections, I believe that the GRE requires, I would say the analytical part is the one that is going to be looked at most from um, our faculty. And okay. Yeah, and that has to do obviously just because of the writing aspect that's going to be required mm -hmm. of you in the program. That's what they're going to want to see as well. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so let me do a new share here to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and press play. Let me. You guys can see this, right? Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Leone. I'm the Director of Financial Aid at the School of Nursing. Welcome to our PhD information session. I'm so glad you have joined us. In this presentation, I will be sharing an overview of financial aid at the School of Nursing. But if you have any specific questions, please feel free to reach out to us at financialaid at sonnet.ucla.edu. In this session, we'll be going over a few topics, including annual student fees for the PhD program, the cost of attendance, how to fund your education using fellowship, federal financial aid and other sources of support, and important dates to keep in mind. Let's begin by reviewing the annual student fees. So student fees include 
UC-wide and campus-based fees. You'll see in the table here, the fee categories and the annual fee charges, as well as the quarterly fee charges. You will pay your tuition on a quarterly basis. Your tuition and fees for the year are $13,321. Health insurance is an annual fee of 4,713. It is mandatory that our students have health insurance coverage. However, you can choose to waive the UC SHIP health insurance requirements and fees if you already have adequate insurance coverage. There's also one time document fee of $100. That means your annual tuition and fees are $18,134 or about $6,011 per quarter. If you are a non-resident, there is a non-resident supplemental tuition fee of $15,102 annually. Current fees for the doctorate program can be found by navigating to registrar.ucla.edu, hovering over fees and residence, and selecting annual and term student fees from the dropdown. You can there specify the academic year, term, and degree on the dropdown menus. The cost of attendance, or COA for short, is an allowance based on educational expenses that students might incur. It includes direct and indirect costs, and it is also the maximum amount of financial aid that students can receive during an enrollment period. You will see in the pie chart the different components of the cost of attendance. The total projected budget for our doctoral program is currently $48,587. Doctoral students can fund their education in a combination of ways, one of which is through fellowships. We offer a university fellowship to each of our entering students, and this covers the full tuition and fees plus health insurance during the first year in the program. On your admissions application, you'll also have the opportunity to apply for multiple graduate division fellowships, including the Eugene Coda Robles Fellowship, which is a four-year renewable fellowship that pays for your full tuition and fees, plus students receive a $25,000 annual stipend. The deadline to apply for fellowship is December 1st, 2022. Students can also apply for federal financial aid. The financial aid application opens up on October 1st each year with a priority date of March 2nd. When applying for federal financial aid through the FAFSA, we can offer a direct unsubsidized loan up to $20,500 annually and a Graduate PLUS loan up to the cost of attendance. Please note the Graduate PLUS loan is a credit-based loan. You can apply for financial aid on studentaid.gov. Other sources of support utilized by our students are through academic apprentice personnel titles. Students holding academic apprentice personnel titles may qualify for fee remissions, which covers approximately 95% of your in-state tuition and fee assessments. That includes 100% of your health insurance, 100% of tuition, and 100% of the student services fee. Students also receive a quarterly stipend of at least $3,800 per quarter. Fee remissions and stipend benefits through academic apprentice personnel titles equates to approximately $29,489 in annual support. Just in case we have any UC employees here, there's also the UC Employee Reduced Fee Program. Eligible regular status UC employees may qualify for a two-thirds tuition reduction uh, in the student services and tuition fees. That equates to approximately $8,568 in annual financial support. 
Now I just want to highlight some important dates. As mentioned, the financial aid application opens on October 1st, so be sure to file your FAFSA if you'd like to receive federal aid. December 1st is our graduate fellowship application deadline. March 2nd is the financial aid application priority deadline. And typically around March or April is when graduate division fellowship award notifications are released to recipients. In August, we release the university fellowship award notifications. You can find more information about financial aid at the School of Nursing on our website at nursing.ucla.edu slash financial dash aid. And you can find more information about graduate division fellowships at grad.ucla.edu. Or feel free to email me your specific questions at financialaid at sonnet.ucla.edu. Thanks for listening. Awesome. So I hope this was informative. Um, what I would also want to say is if you guys do have any like specific questions about financial aid, how to pay for it, FAFSA, the different scholarships and whatnot um, that we offer, please feel free to email her. Um, she's really great at giving back to you. Um, she, she's been excellent. She joined us about a year ago. Um, and so, yeah, definitely we just want to throw that out there. Um, we have about a few minutes until about 2.15. So I didn't know if you guys want to take a quick stretch break, um, but our faculty are going to be joining us uh, pretty soon. Um, so we're going to take a quick little pause. Hi, Dr. Devon, how's it going? Hey, Mark. Um, I think I did made a little boo-boo. A student had contacted me a couple times. I mean, potential. And so I told her we were having an info session today, oh, and okay. I, but I emailed her the, um, the Zoom link, and then I saw on your Zoom link, this is unique to each individual, yes. so I think she won't be able to get in. You know what? It might actually be okay. So, and I think you actually called this from the last information session we had last year, was to convert it from a webinar to an actual meeting, that way we can actually see the attendees' faces, and we can have more of like a dialogue and conversation. So I didn't think of that literally until about ten minutes before today's session. So I did convert it, and so that's why you're going to see a few of our attendees here now. And so Great. hopefully, if she does still kind of log in, she should still be fine, I believe. Wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, she'll still be fine. If not, we're recording the session, and we're going to be posting on our website, and/or she could join us again next month. So. Great. Thank we'll be, you. Yeah. Of course, we'll be just fine. So I did give everyone about a four or five minute break just because we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, so they should all be joining us back shortly. Um, and then we're also gonna wait for Dr. Chin and Dr. Robbins who should be joining us as well. And then we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, oh, hi, Dr. Uh, Scrine Jeffers. So- Mark, how long have you known me? Screen, sorry. I know. <laughs> I've I've been you know you want to know why it's because I call you Kia. Well, you know, so I was like <laughs> I've been calling you Kia for 12 plus years. And so I never know get I could never get your name right. Screen, my I know. Screen. I, I know, screen acting. I know. <laughs> so oh, that's my, good. That's a good yeah. one. It, it is. That's a good one. I won't forget that. Yeah. Well, I, I say that every time and I end up forgetting. Um, but Dr. Screen Jeffers, because um, she's going to have to jet out first. So if it's okay, Dr. Devon, we, we'll give her the first leg. Sure. And then, yeah. And then we'll go from there. So we'll wait and maybe another minute um, to see if the next two are going to be joining us. And then actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop screen share. So at least all of us will be in the same, um, okay. same frame. And then also, Dr. Screen Jeffers, I believe you have a slide, so I can give you, yeah, you need I access. Have a couple. Okay. Keep me on tap. Yeah. So let me uh, do that now. If I can figure that out. So what I'll do now is let me stop share, and then I believe here. There we go. Okay. So you should, do you have access? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
course. So here's Dr. Robbins. Okay, so so just so um, we're cognizant of, of your time, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And then if Dr. Chen joins us, of course, she can jump right in and we can get going. Um, so I'll get... So again, thank you everyone. Uh, we're gonna continue with today's information session. And so I think this part is, is gonna be one of the best parts of the info session <laughs> is where we're gonna have um, our faculty research and clinical expertise panel. Um, and so we should be having uh, four uh, different faculty members join us today. And they're gonna talk about their research expertise. And then we're gonna open it up to see if you guys have any questions. And I think this part will be really cool. We'll just have a little dialogue um, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kia Screen Jeffers, and she's going to talk about her research. Good afternoon. Um, I am uh, an assistant professor in the School of Nursing, um, and I actually went through the PhD program at UCLA in the School of Nursing, and then I did my postdoc, and now I'm on faculty. So um, what I'm going to share with you is a little bit of that trajectory. Uh, let's see, so to share my screen. All right, let's go to presentation mode. Okay, so um, my current study, um, where I am right now is, um, I'm the principal investigator for a study that addresses inequities in mental health among black women. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a few slides. Um, but to give you a little bit about my background, before going into nursing, um, I worked as an actor, and um, I decided to take a break from acting and entertainment to go to nursing school. It was only supposed to be a two-year hiatus, um, but I ended up going on to get my PhD um, because I saw that um, racial ethnic minorities were dying from preventable mental and physical health conditions due to structural racism and other inequities. And I felt a strong responsibility to help stop it. And so since um, graduating from the PhD program, um, I co-authored a chapter in this book, Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional. I've also co-authored papers, one that spoke directly to um, nursing and as a, as a um, discipline um, in terms of you know, speaking out against injustice and including forms of police violence and unjust policing and healthcare. I also co-authored a paper that looked um, looks at the the you know bigger big data um, related um, examinations of associations between lifetime major discrimination and how they um, might impact depressive symptoms among people who have um, chronic health conditions. Um, and I also and uh, have chaired the anti-racism pre-conference workshop at the American Public Health Association's national meeting. Um, this was last year's um, title, um, and it was speaking to, which is healing as an, uh, an act of resistance, because you know, given the pandemic that we're in and, and the heightened awareness of racism and injustice, I thought that people who were engaged in um, this work um, needed some, it needed to take a breath, <laughs> needed to take some healing, um, get some healing. And so our, our session was focused on people who are really engaged in this work and others who um, are supportive of it. Um, but uh, what I also do is make sure I blend um, both of my professional lives as an artist and as a performer, uh, as a scholar. And as a postdoc, um, my team and I were uh, awarded the first grant. This was the first time it was ever offered in California through the California Arts Grant uh, Arts Council that was called the Research in the Arts Grant. And what we proposed to do was to um, develop a play and um, see uh, if audience members um, would have a change in stigma or change in, in their perceptions about 
uh, Black women with depression. Um, and from this grant, we developed uh, a play called We See You Sis. Um, I met with a group of women in South LA um, over the course of four weeks where we talked about our experiences with depression and from those narratives um, developed the play and produced it. We did five shows. Um, and um, from the talkbacks of each of those shows, uh, we um, I developed this intervention, which goes back to the first slide, um, um, addressing inequities in mental health among Black women. <laughs> um, so from the talkbacks, um, we were able to hear what is important, um, what are the you know, pressing things that Black women want to know or address in terms of depression. Um, and the goal was to make it a therapy-based intervention. So we mapped on the themes that were derived from the talk back, like knowing what depression is, knowing about self-medicating, knowing about um, suicidal ideation or suicide, um, and seeking help. Those were some of the themes that um, we found. Um, so we mapped those themes on to a therapy that has been adapted to um, Black Americans in particular. And that is called um, POOP, which is a culturally adapted version of acceptance and commitment therapy. So this intervention will be delivered via Zoom to Black women ages uh, 40 years and older. It'll be peer delivered. Um, and I'm excited to get started. I almost have my whole sample. I need three more people. So um, I'm looking forward to getting started. Uh, but to close, I just want to um, recall that, you know, I pursued a PhD because it's what I was hearing in my nursing classes about health disparities and health inequities didn't at that time speak to the experiences of Black people. And so, you know, these two quotes, um, until the lions have their own historian, historians, tales of hunt will always glorify the hunters. And there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. Um, so with that, I want to invite and encourage you to pursue your PhD journey um, according to what moves you. Um, and I think the more you get, um, the deeper you get into your academic explorations, the more clear your why will become. So that's all I have to say for right now. Uh, let me stop sharing. Um, and if you have any questions, I have like a minute. I have another meeting that's going on right now, actually. No, that that's awesome. If, if it's okay, if, if um, I can provide them with your email address. Yes, that's um, so fine. So they can reach out to you a little bit later if they have more questions about your research or just you and as an individual in terms of, again, why you pursued it. Would that be okay? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> nice see meeting you. you. Okay. So next, I want to pass it over to Dr. Holly Devon. Well, um, that's a very hard act to follow, but I want you all to know that even though my research is not as novel and interesting maybe as Kia's, um, I'm very passionate about it. My name is Holly Devon. I'm a professor and the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Nursing. So my background, I was an ICU nurse, primarily CCU for 18 years, um, 15 years of that as a cardiovascular clinical specialist. That's what I got my master's in. Uh, before I went back for my PhD and went into academia full time. But having been in critical care for a significant amount of time, I was no noticing health disparities but in my patient population, the disparities were primarily between men and women. So I was very interested in looking at sex differences when I was thinking about what I would do for my dissertation. My dissertation chair had an ongoing study 
of um, the influence of bystanders for people that were having heart attacks. And I worked as a research assistant for her. For her. So I started thinking about um, that population, patients who were acutely ill with a potentially life-threatening um, illness, uh, but we don't know what's wrong with them until they get a diagnostic workout workup in the ED. And American Heart Association says up to half the patients who have symptoms of MI don't even go to the emergency department. So that started now almost 25 years of research on um, symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, sex differences in patients with and without ACS, looking at pre-hospital delay in presentation to the emergency department, looking at health disparities in our populations of patients, and we noticed in a longitudinal, in a, um, a large national multi-site uh, study, longitudinal study that we did with 1,100 patients, that six months following hospital discharge, they were still, 33% uh, uh, of the sample were still suffering anginal symptoms. So that led to my interest in symptom management and I collaborated with a colleague who's an expert in acupuncture and uh, Chinese traditional Chinese medicine. And we did a pilot study um, on, on acupuncture for angina. And we're now awaiting, hopefully, a funding notification for a large clinical trial. So those are my primary areas of interest. I have mentored a lot of students over the years uh, many that had interests that varied with me from traumatic brain injury um, to stroke, uh, but that's my primary interest. I also have expertise in measurement and instrument development. So I just want to tell you all that um, when I went into the PhD program, which I did because I had a fabulous mentor, <clears throat> excuse me, in my master's program. When I finally went into the program, many times I thought, oh, I wish I would have started sooner. But I had three children and a traveling husband. So I went back when, when it worked out for the family. Um, so I loved it right from the beginning. It was hard work. I'm not saying that it's not, but I just love doing it. So, um, here I am today, it's all worked out. And I think that nursing is the greatest profession in the world and just provides us with almost unlimited opportunities. Thank you, Mark. Of course, awesome, thank you. And so I know Dr. Vaughn, you'll be hanging out, right? For some questions mm -hmm. at the end. Okay, yeah. awesome. So next, if I can introduce Dr. Wei Chi Chen, uh, would you like to speak? <clears throat> okay, it's my turn. My name is Wei Chi Chen, and um, and I'm a um associate professor at UCLA School of Nursing. Um, um, I am going to share my research projects with you. But mostly, I am doing international projects. Um, as a training as a nurse midwife, and I uh, practice as a, um, a clinician for a while, at the same time pursuing my PhD, working as a labor and delivery nurse, and the end up with my research of interest is more like a woman's health. And at the same time, we're, while taking care of the patients with um, um, STD that also have a postdoc training in HIV-related care. So that start my trajectory working on HIV positive individuals. And in the States, and then most of the populations are um, men who have sex with men. And so my area switch a little bit toward the um, HIV positive individual who are men. But at the same time, because of the um, disclosure issue, stigma issues, we are also taking care of the family members. So um, I have a big project that um, focuses on HIV positive Asian American in the United States. At the same time, um, I finished my K, tra um, K trainings um, in HIV positive women in China. And then um, luckily that I also got a um, R 
03 focuses on HIV positive Asian Americans and their family member focuses on self and family management. And after that, that um, luckily that I have a um, chance to get into global health projects and then at the same time working with um, my collaborator back in Myanmar. So uh, in 2020 that I have funded at R21 focuses in HIV positive individual stigma reduction in Myanmar. And um, not so lucky, the country in back in 2021 have a military coups. So people who got the funding from NH or no, I'm not able to go into the country because of the uh, governmental issues. So I moved my project a little bit to um, um, refugees, M Myanmar refugee who are currently um, um, moved to migrate to Thailand. And then um, also work with my Thailand collaborators and then um, recently just got funded with um, R01, focus on HIV positive um, st stigma reduction in Thailand. And we are friended in, into the Buddhist, um, Buddhism, how the Buddhism religious practice or um, the Buddhist concepts um, decrease their um, stigma. And it's also have a quite interesting that different kind of perspective compared to the current literature mostly focuses on um, real, um, religion, especially Catholic um, African Americans populations. So it will be one of the quite interesting projects and then that are the projects that I'm involving. At the same time, I have another side project is working with our ECLA CFAR focuses on Asian Americans HIV positive in Los Angeles and Orange County for their stigma reductions. Awesome. And now, could you talk a little bit about um, your reasons for wanting to get into nursing and then pursue your doctorate degree? Oh, okay. Why am I getting into nurses? Because it's really... Be because of my personality, I really like I really like to listen to the stories, and I realized that knowing a person, I can know their own stories. So it's quite interesting that when I finished my nursing education, and with one by one encounter with patients, and I realized that there are so many stories inside. But after the clinical rotation. Personally, I don't like the sad story. I only want the happy stories. So. <laughs> <laughs> OPGYN. So she went into them. labor and delivery. Yes, happy. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> so mostly labor and deliveries are the happy stories. So I don't like the people who are really sad when I go into the floor, but 95% of the labor and deliveries are happy, but realize that 5% are still birds and there are more traumatic impacts. So I'm kind of like, okay, so what should I do? It's quite interesting that Korea just slowly folding up. And it becomes like STD is part of my life. And um, as a clinician, at the same time, HIV stigma is also part of it. So that is kind of like a slowly get into PhD study and then get into Asian Americans and then um, stigma reduction. That is how that uh, my research trajectory opening it up. That's awesome. Thank you. And see, yeah. I got to learn something new as well. So I appreciate that. <laughs> So next, we're going to follow it up with uh, Dr. Wendy Robbins. Okay, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, so first, I'd just like to mention about uh, the research group I belong to within the School of Nursing that focuses on work and health. Uh, the group is uh, composed of three full-time research faculty and one part-time research, part-time clinical faculty. We have a training grant from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health for 1.5 million to support nursing students who want to study aspects of work and how it affects health or how health affects work. Um, so currently we support five PhD students and we'll have openings for new trainees next fall. The traineeship covers uh, tuition, and fees and provides uh, pilot project money for research supplies. And so some topics of our trainees have included things like the nursing workforce, um, interventions for job stress, descriptive work on structural racism in nursing, um, burnout, intent to leave, things like that, stigma in African-American immigrant nurses, and other worker populations studied have included adult cancer survivors in various workplaces, um, Latina custodial workers and diabetes management. Um, and so the students have done, you know, 
both secondary data analyses, primary data collection. They've used quantitative methods and qualitative methods. So, I mean, it's a really great group to work with. Um, lots of mentorship for our students. Um, and we have research group meetings um, regularly. And if you're interested in anything about how work affects health or health affects work, um, uh, this, you know, you might consider it. Um, so the other research group I belong to in the School of Nursing focuses on environment and health. How, you know, so, uh, and this group includes two of us right now, but we need to increase our numbers. Um, uh, actually, we just are part of a, a new $22 million grant from Los Angeles County. Uh, it involves the schools of uh, public health here, UCLA, and the School of Nursing, and David Geffen School of Medicine. And we work with community stakeholders. And it's all about the populations affected by um, the um, gas well blowout in Aliso Canyon. I don't know if any of you remember that, but um, uh, terrible pollutants um, uh, just rained down on, on the communities near the um, blowout. And um, I mean, you know, people were sick, their pets were sick. It, it was just was really sad, um, but now, the, the grant, what the grant will do is, is we're creating this massive relational database of exposures and then health outcomes. And so, um, yeah, so, the, so that's the other thing that I'm working on. Um, yeah. We're working with our practice partners uh, from uh, UCLA Health uh, in the Aliso Canyon area. They have a med center there. So... Um, yeah, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, and some of our doctoral students, have, you know, one right now is looking at children and heat exposures. Uh, it's related to, you know, um, climate change and, you know, how we're having all these heat waves. And it seems that parents aren't always aware of some of the dangers for the children. So that's an avenue for nursing as well. So thank you. Of course. Awesome. So Mark, maybe the, um, our guests introduce themselves. Can they introduce themselves and tell us their area of interest? Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> would like to take it away? First, um, my name is Sarah Moreau. I am an ELM student at Charles Drew, graduating in December. Um, I am very interested in behavioral approaches to preventing and reducing the impact of chronic diseases. Um, I, I hypothesize that our patient education that we provide in nursing may not be as effective as we would like it to be. Um, I also have a background in applied behavior analysis and I'm a board certified uh, behavior analyst as well. Um, and so I'm interested in merging what I know about behavioral change and what I know about uh, health and primary care and how I can use that to um, improve health outcomes for people in our community. Thank you. Okay, I can go next. Um, I'm Julie Sorg. I know Dr. Robbins for a long time. <laughs> Uh, I went to UCLA master's program. I work at UCLA Medical Center in the um, School of Medicine. I oversee our research for electrophysiology, um, cardiovascular health. <laughs> I worked in heart failure research for maybe eight or nine years. Um, and I also have operation, hospital operational experience. So my background's somewhat diverse. I have been working in research for 15 years. And so I have always thought about the PhD and have had amazing opportunities to do research with physicians, but I definitely see a need for more nursing, um, more nursing at the table. There's so much research going on with physicians that oftentimes there's a component of the patient that we miss that a nursing science could be an invaluable expertise when they're developing studies. Um, so I have some ideas of things that I am interested in, but definitely cardiovascular health is, has been my passion. So 
Julie, when I was a master's student, um, I was working with a clinical specialist in the CCU. And um, she said, what do you want to do that you haven't done before? I was working at a suburban hospital at the time. And I said, I want to go to the electrophys lab because I don't have any experience in it. And at, in 1981, it was pretty novel. Yes. And I, yeah. I was fascinated, fascinated mm -hmm. by it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the, since I was in heart failure for a long time and now I'm in electrophysiology, I've been able to see the two disciplines and how they, they merge, but definitely there's a need for patients with life-threatening heart rhythms and the amount of anxiety and their end of life options. People don't often think about that. There's a lot of focus on heart failure, but not as much on ventricular tachycardia patients and, and things. So, right. And AFib, a lot of, a lot of research oh, on AFib. Lots of research on AFib as well. Yeah. Quality of life. So mm -hmm. yes. But I also like women's and cardiovascular health because I've worked with the women's and cardiovascular group. I have some ideas, uh, but I, I have always debated between the DNP and the, and the PhD. And as I'm getting a bit more into my other side of the career, the, I'm trending towards the PhD. Right, I pretty much know I will not be doing the DNP. <laughs> I should say it that way. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's great to hear that you're thinking thoughtfully about it because everybody should you know, think about what is the best fit for them. Yeah. What's a good match for their career goals. Yeah. I mean, and when you talked about kind of when to do it in your life and that no time's like the best time, that's a little bit how I have been. I've been really busy in a lot of my um, roles. So I probably could have done it a few times by now, but I've just been trying to find the right time, but realized that's not always there. So mm -hmm. you just have to do it if you want it. That is true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tatiana, would you, I know you're driving, but- Be able to talk. Yeah. yeah. Be safe. Okay. Yeah, be safe. Yeah, I'm going two miles an hour because of uh, 405 traffic. So I think I'm pretty safe, but thank you for including me. Uh, my name is Tatiana Molinar. Um, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I work in critical care at UCLA Ronald Reagan. Um, I live in South LA. I was born, South Central is what it's called, but it's going through this funny rebranding. So I'll call it by the name that I know, which is South Central Los Angeles is where I was born and raised. Um, you know, my kids, just to talk about access, like I have to drive three hours, you know, to get them to a safe school, which is why I'm on the road. Um, and I just, I'm very invested in my community and I really want to find ways to give back. Um, I have a thousand ideas of things that I would like to do. Um, and so I guess that's why I'm working with Charles Drew and hoping to be in the bridge program so that they could help me find um, the most effective way to, uh, you know, have an impact on my community and make sure that my time is well spent um, while learning um, as a PhD uh, student, which is my goal. Um, I'm, my primary interests are, of course, mental health. Um, uh, I, yeah, it can go on. I'm very interested in the, in the psychedelic research. I'm very interested in VR, AR, just immersive technologies and how we can include my communities in, in that revolutionary research, which could really make a difference. So thanks. Great. That's awesome. Thank you. So we, we can leave these next few minutes up to see if there's any type of questions, um, continue this discussion. So feel free to unmute or if anybody has something to say. Um, I, I guess my one thing would be, and maybe we're just speaking to the choir here, but would any of our faculty members be able to see, speak about the difference between ob uh, obtaining a PhD compared to a DNP? Um, just because I, I know there's there could be some confusion out there is, is what should I be doing because I'm hearing it out here in the community that maybe I should be getting this degree over the other. Yeah, we all could. Wendy, do you want to talk about it or? Um, well, uh, you know, the, the PhD is a research degree and the highest degree you can get in academia, uh, whereas the, the DMP is the highest nursing um, practice degree. So. Um, that's where I would start. Um, and, you know, that 
I think of the PhD often asking why, you know, trying to find out why, uh, whereas uh, many times the DMP is saying, um, how can we do it better? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, Holly, you want to add in or Julie? Yeah, well, that was so well stated. You know, I would just say, I think there is a misinterpretation for some people in that they think DNP is PhD light or they select DNP because they don't want to do a dissertation. But, but your decision should be about what do you want to be an expert clinician or do you want to do research? You can have a number of jobs and as Julie knows, I think there's at least seven PhDs at Reagan. Um, and we work closely with a number of them, uh, both in research and in teaching. Uh, so really that's the most important thing. But if anybody has any questions, we can certainly answer. Do you all have master's degree or, or do you want to do BSN to P? Are you interested in BSN to PhD? I believe they're all uh, MSN to PhD, uh, mm -hmm. but Sarah is an ELM to, to, well, to PhD, but still master's prepared. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a master's. My master, master's is in nursing administration. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's where when I looked at the DNP, there's some crossover to what I, I had my master's in nursing admin in the early 2000s. So I've had it for a long time, but um, so there's yeah. some of the same crossover of it's some of the same classes and things, but I do see where the DNP is used more in the health system implementation of like everyday evidence-based practice. And exactly. They're, they're the, they're the, evidence-based practice experts. Mm -hmm. Really, the PhD provides the discovery mm -hmm. and the evidence base mm -hmm. for practice. So um, uh, what you said about implementation is really spot on. Mm -hmm. Would anyone want to talk about maybe the importance of maybe reaching out to a faculty member? Um, if they have a research interest that may be similar to yours? Yeah, I think that's key. Um, when um, the, the applications come in, um, if uh, an applicant has uh, talked with a specific person in the School of Nursing or someone who has a similar research uh, interest, uh, that's really helpful um, because um it just shows that you've you know you've you're really interested i mean you've reached out to someone who you think could be a potential mentor and um uh, that it 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 is important to do that yeah you know um you can look at our website and get more information but I also would Google the faculty and find out more information about their professional engagement, um, look at their publications. Uh, as I mentioned, you don't have to have a perfect match in your field, although we have faculty of interest with all that align with all of your interests um, and see what kind of research they're doing because it is, it is apprenticeship. It's a mentored model of education, very different than undergraduate or master's education, right? So developing relationships um, and especially putting a team together is really important. Okay, I was gonna say, what about, um, is there any, one thing or maybe a couple of things that you would want to leave them with to maybe think about, um, push forward with, anything, I guess, that comes to mind. <laughs> Do it now. Now is the best time. <laughs> I have a quick question, and I apologize if I missed at the beginning because I did have to come in a few minutes late. 
Um, did you speak at all about if the students, your in experience, if the PhD students, how much they do or do not work their first year? Did you already talk about that? And I apologize if you did. No, we did not. That's a great question. Dr. Okay. Robbins, would you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, the the first two years are um, kind of core, core mm -hmm. courses, core content. Um, and so uh, working when you, you have the core content may be uh, um, a bit challenging mm -hmm. uh, because the courses are not like undergraduate courses. Mm -hmm. uh, you read and you, you know, respond on a test. I mean, you're you're exercising your um, creativity. You're looking at uh, things in a new way. And, and that takes time. Um, so, you know, people uh, do do that. They do work. Um, and um, but but if you could really concentrate on on the core, then I think you'd get a lot more out mm -hmm. more out of the program. Yeah, I my mentor at my interview for the PhD said, um, what are you willing to give up so you'll be successful in this program? I just thought that was a brilliant question. And I said to her, well, I guess we'll have to be team tennis, and which hurts me to this day. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's a good thing to think about. You'll be in the program temporarily, not for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. so, so what sacrifices could you make, whether it's working a few less hours or giving up a hobby you know, while you're in the program so you can be successful? and take advantage mm -hmm. of the opportunity to engage with the faculty. That's another thing. Um, I, we have been very successful this year in grant funding and, mm -hmm. and Dr. Chen is, is one of the poster women for success this year in the School of Nursing. So having a chance to engage with faculty um, who can help you as you advance your own science, whether they're in your field or not, is so, so valuable. Great, thank you. All right, if there's no more questions, we're gonna let them go, uh, just because we have uh, Paul Boy, uh, who is one of our current doctoral students, uh, to speak mm -hmm. to you, and so, Mark, can I just say, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. If you have questions or, or you want to talk personally, uh, we'd be happy, very happy to meet with you, you know, on the phone, on Zoom, in person. Don't hesitate to reach out. You can find all of our emails and contact information on our website. Absolutely, please. Thank uh -huh. you. And I'll make sure to give it to them as well. So thank you. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks Thank for joining you. us. And we'll be talking to nice see each to other soon. You. Thanks. You too. All right. So let me go ahead and let Paul in. And we should be having Christina join us. Um, hopefully, uh, she'll be joining us shortly as well. Um, but Paul is excellent. So if, if there's only one person, he's going to make sure to entertain us. <laughs> and give us all the great insight. Uh, so, hey, Paul. Hey, Paul, we should, we should have Christina uh, join us um, as well. So um, hopefully she'll be joining us, uh, but just to, to make sure that we're not taking too much of your time, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll move forward and continue. And then if she joins us, uh, I'll make sure to, to let her in. Um, so we just finished up with the faculty panel, which I thought was pretty awesome. Uh, it was really diverse in terms of who we had. So we had Dr. Weiti Chen, Dr. Wendy Robbins, uh, Dr. Akia Screen Jeffers, as you know, and then Dr. Holly Devon. Uh, so they were all amazing talking about their research interests. Uh, some even dove into, you know, why they even wanted to get into nursing and do, you know, this the, the type of research that they're in now. Um, and so we just wanted to end a today's session, uh, you know, with the student panel. Um, the first thing that's coming to mind is because one of the questions we asked our faculty panel was, 
pretty much like the difference between PhD and DMP. Mm. And so, yeah. And so you would actually be the perfect person that will kind of do it. It's to, a trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We'll segue kind of into that. So um, first, I guess, introduce yourself, um, talk about your research interests. Sure. And then um, I guess then we'll follow up because, you know, you you were kind of split like, hey, should I should I go to PhD realm or should I do DMP? So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, right. we'll start with that. Okay, well, hello everyone, and thank you for visiting the PhD Info session today. My name is Paul. I currently work as a hospitalist nurse practitioner over at Santa Monica Hospital at UCLA Santa Monica. So um, I graduated at UCLA as an NP, and then I'm like, okay, maybe going back to school is fun. I don't know, <laughs> but um, I uh, I did get in at the, and we started during the pandemic 2020. So we are part of the Zoom um, university at that time. Um, and so, um, like I said, so I work as a hospice nurse practitioner. And so stress, work stress has been sort of like an interest of mine prior to the pandemic. Let me just tell you that. And then the whole 2020, 2021 happened and it just really um, like uh, gave more credence to my interest in work stress. So um, my research interest right now is actually we're hoping, uh, well, we are starting a pilot study um, on a mindfulness uh, intervention for, uh, uh, specifically for healthcare workers. Um, and so we will be sort of measuring um, stress levels, um, also we'll be using like a biomarker, uh, cortisol as well. And um, it's like a whole bunch of like things that are happening and I'm like, okay, what did I get myself into? Um, so it's it's interesting because Mark did allude to that. I, I, um, I was like, should I do a DNP or a PhD since I'm sort of like in that boat? So it, I think it all boiled down to actually talking to the faculty I remember talking, doing this info session, I did talk to Dr. Robbins and Dr. Lee, um, and it just sort of like gave me in that PhD column, um, just because I have interests sort of, I guess I wanted to marry being a provider and doing new research. And so, which I think is it, like, when they think NP, you just go to DNP. So I think it's it's a little bit rare to have that sort of connection. So um, so I'm a third year, oh, sorry, I didn't say that. I'm a third year PhD student. Um, Mark knows my whole history as a student since 2014. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm doing this mindfulness study. We're hoping to get it started, um, hopefully uh, by this quarter. I'm recruiting um, participants at the moment. And yeah, hopefully I'll be done by next year. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a good start for me, Mark. Let me know. Uh, yeah, and fire away, people. <laughs> no, th that's great. Um, and gosh, third year already, right? <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like that's, Lord. Yeah, I'm like, that, yeah, that's how fast it goes. Um, mm -hmm. And even Christina, are you guys in the same cohort? No. no? Uh, are you 2020? Oh, okay, so first let me just, yeah, before I start guessing. Um, Christina is uh, also one of our PhD uh, students. Um, and so, yeah, if you would like to just introduce yourself, um, I, then I guess say what year you're in in the PhD program, um, and then what your research interest is, or what you're Thank currently you, doing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so sorry for being late. Um, I was having an issue with my computer, so I had to run over into the office and uh, log in. But um, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Cabrera-Mino. Uh, right now I'm a second year doctoral student in the School of Nursing. I was actually also a Meccan student. Uh, so I've been, I'm a double Bruin. Um, I'm very proud of that. And my main research interest right now is looking at the neurocognitive outcomes in congenital heart disease, specifically within the adult patient population um, and seeing whether there's any modifiable or non-modifiable factors that we can target for future interventions. Awesome. So I'll go ahead and open it up uh, for the attendees that are here with us today. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask. Um, but I'll, I'll jump in as you guys may be thinking of one. Um, let's talk about maybe like the day in the life of, of being a, a PhD student. I know it's a little bit different, right? Because you guys actually both started during the pandemic as, as long as we've been in it. Um, so what, what has that been like? Um, you know, are we enjoying it? And you know how are those kind of different stressors impacting that? 
Uh, sure, I can start. Well, number one, I'd say run. No, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it has been interesting. I think, um, you know, I, I'm assuming most of us are probably in the workforce too. So there's always a uh, consideration as far as starting school. But, um, you know, we do, you know, especially the past couple of years, like nursing research or, or research in general has really grown. So um, there have been, at least for me, I'm at third year now, my uh, I don't know if Christina knows Megan and Mayumi. We have, yeah. So we have the same faculty and it has been sort of a, so this past summer we were able to produce two uh, publications, um, which was awesome. I, I didn't have any summer break, I guess. So, but okay. <laughs> but so that was fun going through the motion, just writing um, and able to produce um, like something that hopefully will help you know, um, the future. And so um, work and school uh, is going to be interesting. Um, but if you do go to school, I'd say really, I think you you all know what you're getting into. And so school is going to really take a lot of the focus every quarter. So I, I'm sure Christina will add more to it. So in my experience, um, uh, after the first year seemed to really be, you know, just getting uh, my feet underneath me and just trying to pick up the essential skills that I will, you know, base a lot of my PhD work on in later years. So, you know, brushing up on your statistics, there is um, several statistics courses that were quite difficult, but of course, very important to learn. Um, and I think one of the in day in the life of a PhD student nowadays, um, well, I'd say now we're back to fully in person. Um, so that's, that's actually nice. It's great. It facilitates discussion. You also get to meet a lot of students outside of the school of nursing. Um, when you're doing your cognates, which are, you know, classes you have to take outside of the school of nursing that are more focused to your area of research. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing is organization. So for me, I am in the process right now of trying to write my first NRSA. Uh, so you, yeah, <laughs> you're, oh, so you, I leave yeah. that to you. I, I can. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's very interesting because you have to start setting a lot of internal deadlines for yourself. So I have, you know, and you have to be accountable to yourself. You are your own boss. And that means it's up to you to actually get this stuff done. It's, you have to write this. You have to think about who you need to collaborate with, what sort of courses you have to take, um, what sort of training you need. Um, and just really think about, you really get into the nitty gritty of what it means to do the research you're doing. So like every little variable of your project, how do you measure that? You know, what, what special aspects of your patient population? Um, so that's where my frame of mind is right now, where I'm just thinking about writing all the time. Even in my downtime, I'm thinking, okay, how can I, you know, you know, address this variable in our study? And you know, how can I account for, you know, certain covariates or certain issues that may arise? Um, so yeah, your first year is mostly getting, you know, getting just to go, it almost feels like regular school in the sense that you're going to your classes. That's where a lot of your time is spent. You're writing your papers. And then if you decide to write for, go for a grant uh, in your second year, then it sort of shifts. And there's a lot of stuff that you have to start setting on yourself. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky to have a fantastic advisor um, who is giving me like the steps that I have to complete. Yeah, I just want to echo a little bit of what Christina's saying. I think year one is really, remember APA 7? She's coming back. Um, really just time management is really key. There's going to be like the classes are, I'd say intense, but there's a specific reason why it is intense. And it's just to really broaden our mind. Like, I got to tell you, I don't know if Christina um, would agree, like the philosophy class, I thought like, okay, I got this. And I keep every week and I'm like, oh yeah, huh? Like, <laughs> so you're you're like learning and you're like, oh, I did, I've heard of that word, but I didn't know the thinking behind it. And the classes in the first year are sort of like stepping stones for that first sort of major, right, Christina? Like the major paper, the written qualifying. And so uh, first year is like have a brand new laptop have two desktops, everything's all like, uh, you know, you're gonna plan everything. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's it's classwork for you. And so I had asked that in the last session about the the students, PhD students working or not. And so mm. could you comment if you 
continued to work or you how what you did or can you or whatever you have to say. <laughs> oh. Christina, you, you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. So in so in my case, I, I'm in, I'm kind of in a, an odd case um, for me because I actually went directly from the Meccan. So that's the master's entry clinical nursing program directly into the PhD program. Um, so I am definitely a little bit more deficit when it comes to, you know, having a, you know, working as an RN um, in a hospital setting. Um, but I do keep my clinical skills sharp by participating uh, or essentially be, being a part of these studies where I am going to the hospital and, you know, just doing essentially acting as a research nurse. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one way that I do work, but a lot of it all just feeds back into my research. Um, yeah. I also can work as a TA and that's actually a fantastic experience. I've loved it every quarter. You do get, the nice thing about being a TA is that you get in your second year, you get your um, situation and health insurance covered and also a stipend, um, which is great. And so that's mm -hmm. also another way a PhD student can work. Um, there's also several groups on campus. Um, technically, I am an intern for psychological services here on campus with the students. Um, so I do get a, it's a small, small salary, but you know, it's, it's still nice to get paid um, working with them throughout the quarter. And it's also just a great experience to stay connected to campus. And also it sort of feeds into how I can act as a, uh, you know, a facilitator um, and sort of intermediary between psychological services um, and the undergraduate students I frequently TA with. So sometimes I may have to refer them to psychological services and being a part of the student group that also does pay me, you know, does help me do that. Mm -hmm. okay. That's great. And Mark, don't tell Dr. Rob. It's great. <laughs> so <laughs> since I started 2020, so our classes were all Zoom. Uh, my work schedule, so I, I still work full time. Um, okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, but um, I guess it's sort of the advantage is like my work, um, which is very rare actually for an NP is like I work 12 hours, three days a week. So mm -hmm. I like the rest of the week to devote. Mm -hmm. so first two years were all Zoom, but a lot of shifting with schedules for sure. Um, I can I can also share and just to put it in context, I mean, I'm single, I have no wife, no kids. So I'm like, just worry about me. So that's all because it can also add obviously to, you know, mm -hmm. how you plan this. Mm -hmm. So um, I work at UCLA, like I said, I always, I wanted to be a TA, but uh, I know I, I can't because of our union. Um, but um, it, there's some shifting that I have to do with schedule wise and vacation and PTO just so I can continue, um, you know, with the deadlines and all of that. I'd say it's possible, but it really depends how your work schedule is at the moment. Christina did say it. Um, I mean, let's just be realistic here. Um, we're in inflation. So the great thing about it is like they offer TA, which is a pretty good gig, I'd say. And they have stipends as well. So definitely something to consider. Yeah, yeah I have a full-time job. So I'm just trying to structure my brain around what I would do with that full-time job or um that's helpful I, that's very helpful yeah. yeah I mean I realized I don't think I've heard you pretty much cannot work almost full-time the first year so I just was getting a little feedback now that things are more zoom we all know it takes more time to get to you but I, it sounds like you're back on campus full-time yes yes it was full-time my classmate actually is the director of education at UCLA and she would sort of like block two hours for school time during work hours mm -hmm. and her work like was gracious enough to do that so mm -hmm. but the thing is and I think Christina did say it, it's in class now so I, I'm not because I'm third year now yet but um, <laughs> um so yeah so yeah, definitely just something to consider. but I remembered I think if you talk to your there was this one person I forgot who it was a, a couple of years ago but I, I guess it's all about talking to your advisor mm -hmm. and see what options there are so yeah sarah jump in if you have questions because i keep asking <laughs> questions <laughs> no i i had the the same question i am um, finishing up my elm right now and mm -hmm. i'm sure that come fall my husband would love it if i had a job so um to make that work is something that i have to figure out i guess also i'm kind of curious as to whether this timing like Christina and did this work out for you to go directly yeah my in my case it it, it actually ended up working well um and I I really do appreciate the ability to just I I really did like the people I was working with at UCLA and so to be honest I, I really wanted to stay here 
and they and they were quite supportive of me, you know, seeking out clinical experiences. In in my case, I actually um, was going to work with actually was starting to work with Cedars um, as one of their new grad RNs. Um, the thing, uh, however, there were some personal issues in my family that I had to step back and help take care of my mom and everything during that time. Um, also, in my first year, I was also one of the students that did technically overload um, my quarters. So I, I at one point I took six classes. Um, that's not typical for a lot of PhD students. That's I know. That, so yeah, that's you know because I actually ended up taking a lot of my cognates or quite a few co of my cognates then, and um, I was just like I want to free up my my second year because I know I want to get a grant done. So it really does depend. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it really does depend on, on your main goals. Um, so I knew I wanted to get ready for that grant and I knew I wanted to get a lot of the, um, you know, I guess the harder courses. Like uh, we, I always took, I took one of the biostatistics courses within the biostatistics department. Um, oh, that was I heard quite, about that class. Yeah, 406. Yeah, yeah, that was quite difficult. Um, you know, a lot of different uh, statistical software mm -hmm. packages that you get to learn. Yeah. Um, so basically programming, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, so for me, yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, like six, six classes in a quarter working every day. There's no, there's no off days really. Um, no. that, that's something I did to myself, <laughs> but, um, like go, going forward, like once I have this grant underway, um, I am going to expand more my clinical, uh, essentially my clinical experience and I have different offers right now that I can use to explore that. So I also just wanted to add, there will be a quarter where, yes, I, I did the same thing where I had like, I think five or six on a couple quarters. And so uh, I, I think at ELM to PhD is a different track than mine. Uh, so I wanted to get rid of the cognates, which are classes outside the School of Nursing that you have to complete to broaden your horizon and perspective in life uh, and all of that. So which what well christina it worked out because right now i only have a direct class with my advisor basically it's two classes that i'm just zooming in because i don't need to go to campus so um yeah do to plan out there are uh, there's probably a quarter or two where you might want to load up on your classes so yeah so it's flexible then in terms of mm -hmm. curriculum um i don't know it was cognates if i'm saying that right mentioned yeah. during the it felt like they kind of briefly covered the sort of areas of study, yeah. not necessarily the classes. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Robbins didn't go over them too much. Um, and it's probably just a little bit difficult because of the, the different tracks, right? BS, PhD, mm -hmm. ELM to PhD, mm -hmm. and, and we'll, we'll call it the APR and the PhD. So that's mm -hmm. probably why she didn't go too much in depth into those. But what we can do um, is I can send those like sample core sequences out to you guys. Mm -hmm. um but i do believe they're on our website um I but, so. I read it. yeah but if they're not because I, I keep saying i'll send this to you i'll send that to you it, reach out to me right please email me and then i'll make sure <laughs> to get that to you um but but you're right sir because also what i'm hearing is it's a lot more flexible than what mm -hmm. it's projecting it to be yeah. um and that's also due to you know just your own flexibility as a student time management things like that so um, I, I do think that's actually a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and Paul, who, who was your yeah. faculty? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. No, no, uh, go, go ahead, Julie. Oh, well, I was going on a different question. So I just it's, wanted it's, to quickly add on the comments oh. real quick. So Mark is like our like my own hero because like he knows everything. He's like the matrix of the school of nursing. <laughs> His office, I feel it has like six computers, and I don't know how he does it all. But cognates, um, you're required 12 units which is potentially three or four classes outside the school of nursing um i talked it out with my advisor like mm -hmm. hey there's this psychology class um that's like sort of like in line with stress and so he approved it the only caveat is like these classes need to be a 200 class and above mm -hmm. which means it's like graduate level um so they do offer a lot and it is very flexible you don't have to take it this quarter or anything you can stagger it to your pace yeah, like this quarter, I'm actually taking, I don't know, Paul, were you in that uh, with Dr. Bauer? 
Uh, oh, there was another poll in nursing that was in Dr. Bauer's class. Um, it, it's in, this is in psych. It was also on, on stress and uh, biological foundations of behavior. Uh, um, no. no. Okay. No, oh, sorry. I, 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 that ain't me. No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. There was another one. There's another Paul there. Okay. Also nursing. Okay. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so like I didn't have to take that cognate now. Um, and, you know, my advisor was like, well, you know, since you are going to be writing your NRSA, you know, maybe you want to hold off. And I thought, no, maybe I can actually use a lot of this knowledge that I, I saw the course syllabus and they're, they're quite welcoming in other departments. Um, mm -hmm. they, they like to hear your perspective. And I actually thought it ended up being a good decision because a lot of the stuff that there's like, even today, some of the stuff I, I saw in class today, I'll probably be drawing on for writing my NRSA. Mm. Do, I was gonna ask you, who is your faculty advisors? I, did you say that? I'm sorry if I missed it. Sure. Mine is Dr. Jian Lee, and I'll put okay. my name here in the chat. So he's he holds, uh, um, professor Rack in the School of Nursing and the School of Public mm -hmm. Health. I see. Mm -hmm. And mine is Dr. Nancy Pikes. Oh, Dr. Pikes. Two well, great so you, guys, you guys have two good ones. <coughs> and how did, did you, you oh, yeah, go ahead. I think we're gonna ask the same question. <laughs> <laughs> how did you contact and introduce yourself to these faculty members? Yeah. So the number one thing that I did was actually attend the info session um, 20, I'd say 19 or something. And Dr. Lee and both Dr. Robbins were there. So I sort of spoke to them about it. And then after the info session, you know, you had to think more because their deadlines approaching. And then I emailed Dr. Lee. Hi, Dr. Lee. I don't know if you remember me, you know, like introduced myself to him um, regarding my um, interest on stress. And he replied back. So uh, once you go through the motion of admission and um, you get, I don't know, if you get interviewed or something, then you get to talk to a potential advisor. And yeah, that was, it sort of just um, like happened to me. It's like he was just there and it was the same interest. And both Dr. Robbins, uh, Dr. Robbins is Oc Health. So it just kind of worked out for me, so. And as for me, um, I was fortunate enough to actually have research experience um, with my advisor previously. Um, and so to be honest, I, I, I guess because I had I'd done research before with her as a research associate, you know, we worked well professionally. Um, and I also just uh, appreciate her working style, you know, very organized, sequential, you know, we're, I, I love that we have like a whole box account, just like full of calendars and little checklists. So. This, this definitely fits my style too, not just research interests, but also um, the mentor and student relationship. Yes, can I just add the mentorship here is collegial. Um, they know what we don't know, okay? Look, I don't know how many inches the border is on the paper, okay? But it's all laid out in Google, so I'm using that. But they, they, they do make us think, and I hope Christina will also agree, like, think, like, what are the next steps you think, you know? Um, so it's, it's really, there is a mentorship, there's collegiality. I don't know about Christina, but I get free dinner sometime. So, yeah. Yeah, same as, I, I totally agree, Paul. <laughs> Did they, um, well, I guess each of you had a little bit different case, but do you find that the PhD students match up with someone based on the student being interested, like, I mean, I'm in cardiovascular health, but it doesn't, but I also like certain outcomes and it, there's just, do they tell each other, maybe you'd be better off here or just you start somewhere that's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. So, um, and thank you, Paul and Christina, because earlier mm -hmm. in the session, I was like, make sure you reach out. Like we've kind of been saying that throughout. So yeah. I'm glad you guys also reiterated that. Um, but yes, if, even if you reach out to someone as your potential mm -hmm. advisor, they don't necessarily have to be it. Um, so, you mm -hmm. know, after the interview process, um, the Student Affairs Committee uh, chair with some of the members will discuss who they think would actually be the best fit for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it also goes with that. So, yeah, it, it's all about making sure that you'd be successful. Um, and then at some point after being admitted, they let you know. And then uh, it, you can even have co-chair. So, so, but it's all collaborative, basically in a sense, with you um, and your faculty advisor. 
yeah. or, is, or plural. I wanted to add to, um, if you also look at the School of Nursing faculty list, um, that, that could be a list of potentials. Mm -hmm. uh, for Julie, if cardiovascular health, Dr. Retz Hanna is, is mm -hmm. he, she's in my committee, so that's okay. why. I'm doing a, my mindfulness study also touches on cardio, uh, on hypertens hypertensive mm -hmm. healthcare workers, so that's why. So she, mm -hmm. she's a good one, so. And probably also Dr. Devon, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, she also does cardiovascular outcomes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Macy yeah. is also good for neurocog, right? Like, Christine, oh, and get him. He's so... Dr. That, Macy, that, yeah, I, yeah. I know who he is, too. We do some stuff in neuroscience research. Yep. And you, and you saw how Dr. Devon was pretty giddy when she heard... <laughs> Julie, about yours. So I know sometimes I feel like cardiovascular has so many, like so much is being done for that. It, but I, I mean, when it's, but there's still so much to do. It's kind of oh, interesting. It's like, can I, yeah. can I tell you, I mean, there's, there's more, especially with COVID, like, you know, what are the rates of pericarditis yes. that are like um, popping up among patients? We have mm -hmm. um, patients that are long COVID haulers from the 2020. And I know the infectious disease yes. teams, UCLA are doing studies. So there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Yeah. And you're doing adult congenital, Christina? Yes, I am. Yeah. Is, is Mary Kenobio still? Is she? Are you work with her like at all or no on your she, patient population? I don't no. think she, so. Okay. Yeah, she just retired. Oh, yeah. she did. Okay. She all right. did. Yeah. I know her because she's... She emails me to give students, and I said, Mary, they don't give me gift cards. How can I say yes? <laughs> but she's a hoot. Oh, I love her. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's amazing. Yeah, she retires. So I'm not sure uh, if she's oh, coming yeah, back I to just, yeah, yeah. participate. Yeah, yeah. no, I've just, no, no, that was her area for a oh, long no, time. If, you, if congenital, I know UCLA has the adult, like there's a specific, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So um, actually, the director of that will be on my committee, my dissertation committee. Nice. Um, so yeah, so that's that's another great thing about being at UCLA. You know, it is one of it is. I, I mean, we've been what number one public institution university in the world. So um, for how long now? Um, so there's so many ways you can get connected um, mm -hmm. to you know facilitate your research interests. You know, and get like the experts involved, which is you know a really great thing. Um, so I already have a quite a, essentially my my general committee has already tentatively been built up over the summer. Um, and each person is sort of like a little, is an expert um, mm -hmm. in an area. You know, I have congenital heart disease, you know, in the adult population population, um, you know, biostatistics, a biostatistician, um, looking at gender differences and psychosocial outcomes, you know, especially really like depression, anxiety, um, and also the effect of socioeconomic status, things like that. So when you start designing your project and, you know, really narrowing down what you're going to be um, studying, uh, you can find people to sort of fill in the gaps with their expertise. Mm -hmm. You can you you better uh, put the dissertation um, thing because it took me like three months for them to reply that it's approved. So uh, don't worry about that. No, it'll, it'll it come later. When you guys yeah. come. Yeah. <laughs> Just lots of paperwork. That's all I can say. Yeah. And are you all are you thinking like do you have yourself set for amount of time? I mean. It sounds like Christina took a lot of classes fast. Are you trying to do under five years or like four years or? I mean, um, in my case, uh, I know it's, it's, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure the work gets done. That's basically what I keep telling myself. Like, yes, you can decide, you know, race against the clock and go out as fast as you can. Um, but that doesn't always mean that your project really came together. Um, mm -hmm. So I, at least in at least for my goals, um, you know, I I hope to become an academic researcher, you know, to be at a R1 research institution as a professor one day and running my own lab and also teaching because those are I do enjoy teaching and I also really do enjoy research and want to contribute to the field. Um, so in my case, uh, they tend they tend to look look down if you take more than like five years to graduate, you know, but usually it takes about four to, it's expected like four to five years to graduate. Um, sometimes you can go a little bit faster depending on, on your research, you know, whether you're working on like a second uh, set of, you know, data that has already been collected and you're running just a secondary analysis on that, that's different. I will actually be recruiting patients and, you know, quite a sizable amount and I'll actually be, you know, doing a study on them 
Um, and that may take, you know, two years and then like another year for analysis or other things I have to account for. Um, so it's, I, so I, I think it's important not to have like, again, a set time you want to be out, just uh, plot what your plan is in yeah. reasonable inter- in expectations. Yep. Uh, I think four years should be good. And now I may be on a different sort of path given that, you know, I've sort of, I've, I'm working, I'm, you mm-hmm. know, I've established uh, yeah. a good job. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe, yeah, the next two, like the first two years was all didactics and all of this. And then the next two years is just, you know, finishing my uh, pilot study and hopefully um, get that going with it. Right now I'm starting my dissertation because um, I passed the written, uh, well, the oral will be the next one. So there's more, there's more, there's more stuff. But uh, I, I'm what I'm saying is like, yeah, I think four years should be good. But then, you know, life happens. Yeah, I know. Enrolling patients is yeah. people too. It takes a lot yeah. of time. And yeah. it's okay. You can take a quarter off. Um, and they're so nice about it. They're like, yeah, just, you know, just take a quarter off. It's, and it's fine. Like, it's not really a race against the clock mm-hmm. or it's not like the dnp were like in two years you're supposed to be done mm-hmm. this is a dip, this is different we're we're different um and so yeah you, it's at your own pace uh and uh yeah i think four to five years christine is right yeah, yeah that's yeah. that seems to be the goal and also the one thing to think about is like what is the end goal after this so mm-hmm. like christine i i i also teach i actually will be teaching at mount st mary's next uh awesome. next year mm-hmm. too uh, I used to, t- I know this guy teach, my gosh, <laughs> um, but yeah, like for me, I want to sort of marry like as a provider doing a research and teach. So hope, you know, there's like little avenues for me. So that's something to think about as like you write your essay, and, you know, as you go through this motion. So. Yeah. And I like how you guys <clears throat> pretty much at the end, you guys both talked about obviously your passion in your research, but then the teaching aspect. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what this PhD program can afford individuals as well. Yes. So oh, yeah. boy. they're going to make you do like um, lectures and mm-hmm. you're just like, so during zoom, 30 second story, I was like, okay, Dr. Lee's like, um, okay, you're going to teach about ethics next week. I'm like, Oh, ethics. Okay, <laughs> but it's it's good. Like I had to make sure that my Wi-Fi connection is on. I have like three computers up and all of that. But it's 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 good. Like for me, I think it's my way of giving back to the profession um, as a nurse and as an NP. Like what I wanted to do later on is actually teach like NPs because like I feel like that's like um, an area that needs improvement. Um, so it can be any other. Um, reason that you want to do it but yeah the teaching aspect is like the the academic aspect of it like it's we we're like we don't have a lot of teachers you know and um Mm -hmm. so this is this is very pivotal especially for our profession yeah and then even in my case where I don't have as much um you know nursing experience as an RN I can still contribute in the teaching environment so a lot of times Um, you know, I've helped out with a research design class, you know, and I was able to give a lecture there. Um, and, you know, based on student feedback, apparently I I did great. So, and they did feel like they learned, you know, learned from me. Um, so it was, it was a really good experience. And then I also, you know, do love physiology and, you know, that is a lot of my work is involved in, you know, pathophysiology. So I do bring quite a bit of that into the classroom when I do have opportunity to do a TA lecture. Yep. Awesome. So we have another minute or so. Loving this conversation. But if there is last question, maybe several questions, whatever the case is, I I do still want to leave you guys time to to speak to these two wonderful people, um, but also just be cognizant of the time. So feel free to open up if you have more. Mine is really fast. Um, How many are in your class each? Like, like 10 to oh, okay. small. Yeah, I think my cohort right now is seven, eight to seven. But then yeah. like, pre-pandemic, it was like 12, it was 10. Yeah. Like, yeah, and then the pandemic happened. So that also has like sort of a um, an effect to it. But 
for all of you, I think about it. It is it's intense, like I said, but it has some good and you know some good things to it. Um, uh, oh yeah, oh someone had a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Tatiana. The car, yeah. Hi. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I wanted you to finish. Oh, no, no. Please. Okay. Um, I was just asking, I guess, in the same vein, if um, like how often are you on campus, and like how many hours do you spend, uh, you know, in class? I will leave that question to Christina because I will <laughs> zoom. <laughs> so it does depend on what year you're in and like what are your goals uh, for that quarter. So in the first year where you actually are taking those adaptive classes, you know, building your foundational skills um, in biostatistics or nursing philosophy, things like that, you will be on campus um, likely like three times a week. Um, and, you know, they are flexible po in a post-COVID world. Like it's not really post-COVID, um, you know, after... <laughs> Uh, to our, it's, you know, it's everywhere. So they are flexible. Like if you are sick, you can zoom in or they'll record class for you. So that's a nice thing that uh, that's still, it's more available to you now. Um, the second year, it really is, again, depends on how, what your what kind of students you're, are coming in, you know, whether you're an ELM or a BSN or, you know, a master's, a master, uh, like an MSN. Um, you're either taking classes, you know, the first two quarters and then like the third quarter, you're now transitioning more into focusing on your research. Um, so for me, I've, I'm, I'm usually on campus, you know, four to five days, the fifth day is really because I am collaborating with other student groups or something like that, you know, doing a group project for another class, or just want to take advantage of, you know, the resource that we have here on campus um, to help me, you know, it's, it's a nice, good place to write your papers. Um, but yeah, that, that's usually how often I'm at, I, at least I'm on campus. And then, of course, by the third year, it does change. Yeah, I do. I do want to say, I think first year, I think you're you're probably four days, I'd say is a good amount in on campus. There is a Ph.D. lounge, which I actually go to so I can like get out of the house, oh. like, like write something. So the Ph.D. lounge is a good place. There's a fridge, there's a microwave. So and chocolate. Uh, Yes, the chocolate. Oh my God, was that you who brought it? Thank you. But um, <laughs> so there are resources for you to really, um, you know, to help you with your writing. Uh, but yeah, do you expect maybe three to four days? And that doesn't, um, uh, uh, what do you call this? Meeting your advisor doesn't it, it doesn't count there because who knows what time you mm -hmm. know? And the classes aren't staggered where there's a class in the morning and class in the afternoon. No, it's a there's a class in Monday two ten a. Then you have a class on Tuesday and then a class on Thursday. Like that's how I remembered it. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, just good luck. Think about Thank it. You. Mark owes me like three coffees for doing this three times now. I really do. I really do. I was, I was gonna mention that. Oh, no, it's it's. Uh, it's I'll buy a coffee, Paul, over there at Santa yes. Monica. <laughs> just uh, just just mind the deadline. Uh, Come to CHS and, Cafe. Yes, please. Yes. And I, I'm rooting for you all. Uh, you guys, look. If I can do it, you guys will do it way more. Just there you go. So good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks for the information. That's great. Good awesome. luck, everyone. Best of luck. Yes. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Christina. It, yeah, these are double Bruins. I think Paul might be a triple Bruin. I don't know. Paul's been here forever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I think it just it just shows kind of pretty much the excitement, um, you know, to what we have here in the School of Nursing and into the campus. So thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And so thank what you. I'm actually going to do is we're, we're going to end this session. Um, I thought it was really great. I wanted to say thank you for hanging in there. There was some little bit of technical difficulties, uh, but then also within the last two and a half hours. Um, so you guys should have my email um, address. Um, in the previous slide, you had the faculty panel's address, email address. So feel free to reach out to them. I also have Christina and Paul's email address. So I'm gonna throw that to you guys as well. Um, but basically just to end the session is, as you see, we're all people that we want you guys to come to and speak to us because uh, we want you guys to be successful. Um, so again, I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll be talking soon. Deadline's December 1st. And if you need any assistance, please let me know. If not, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks again. All right. Bye. 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 Nice to meet everybody. Uh, bye. Bye.